I want you to focus with me for just a moment on a particular scripture that is in the book of John. And as we look at this scripture in John, the fourth chapter, I'd like to read to you verses 5 through 14, if I could. If you would, they'll put that on the screen for us. And uh, I really thank God for our techno people. Uh, I'm kind of a dinosaur. Uh, I've learned to use a few of these things, but when I get them all messed up, I call my grandson so he can fix it for me. And so it's, a, it's an interesting day. But here it is in the book of John. John chapter 4. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which I am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. The next verse says it all. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of living water springing up into everlasting life. And everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Let's talk about this water from the well. And as we talk about this water from the well, I'd like for you to get a picture of this woman. She is a woman that's got some tragedies in her life. Having tragedies in her life, she's, she's made some bad decisions. Turn around and ask the person beside you, have you ever made a bad decision? Well, this woman has made some bad decisions. It almost looks like she's made five of them because she's been married five times. And it looks like she might have made another bad decision. The one that she's living with now was another woman's husband. She's made a few bad decisions. So she comes to the well, and she comes to the well on the sixth hour or at noon. She comes at noon because that's the hottest part of the day, and that's the time of the day that most of the citizens and the people and the women of Sychar are at the house or found a cool place or they're taking their siesta. The reason she chooses to come at noon is she doesn't want to face all the public opinion of her. She's got a reputation. Reputations are hard to live down. Some people never have the privilege of living them down. But here it was that she shows up at this well. Showing up at this well is an interesting place. Jesus intentionally has asked to go through Samaria. With every intention, he chose to go through Samaria. Now, that That may not sound important to you at the moment, but let me explain it. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and the Samaritans didn't like the Jews. The Samaritans thought the Jews were snobs, and and the Jews thought that the Samaritans were unclean. 
and that they had no right or privilege to, to have any association with them. In fact, the, the Jews just thought they were better than everybody else. The reason for this being, it goes back several centuries. It goes back to the time that the Assyrians in 721 B.C. came down on the city of Samaria and captured it. And they did uh, what, what was called genocide. And what they did was they killed all the men or they, or they neutered them. And then the soldiers of Assyria had copulation and relationships mostly by rape of the women of Samaria. And the offspring that was born of them that created then the next generation of population in Samaria, they were, quote, half-breeds. They were half Assyrian and half Jew. Well, because of that, and even the law of Moses, then because that these children were a product of such a situation, then the Jews looked down on them. Now, doesn't it seem odd that this man Jesus would come. But let me, let, first of all, let me tell you something about Jesus. I want to tell you, how many of you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? All right, remember the story of the Good Samaritan. You'll remember that the, the Levi went to the other side of the street. The priest didn't have anything to do with him because he was on his way to the temple and too busy. But when the Good Samaritan came by, he walked across the street he looked down, he helped the man that had been robbed and wounded and tore apart. And he was titled was the Good Samaritan. And Jesus identified as the Good Samaritan. Now I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why because for all practical purposes, Jesus Christ was a half-breed. How's that so, Brother Harper? That is so because his father was our heavenly father who was not a Jew. And his mother was Mary of the tribe of Judah that was a Jew. And what I want to tell you is this, is the whole ancestry of Jesus Christ brings us down to recognize that he specifically chose to go through Samaria because going through Samaria was where that he was going to give an illustration of how important it is for we as Christians today to lay aside our prejudice, our preconceived ideas, even get over ourselves and get over the fact that we might think we should or should not be in the company of so and so. And so he went by to give us a demonstration. And giving the demonstration to that, he, he looks he goes to the well. Now this well, if you please, Genesis the 33rd chapter and verses 18 through 20, I'll read that to you. This is the well that the man by the name of Joseph, or, or that Jacob did dig. And here it is in Genesis 33, verses 18 through 20. And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paradama and pitched his tent before the city. The next verse says, And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamar, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. Next one says, And he erected there an altar and called it Elohi Israel. The word Elohi, El, El Elohim it, of Israel, it simply means this. The God, the God of Israel. And so he erected an altar, and there he digged the well, we find out here. And here at this very well that Jacob digged, in the land of Samaria, Jesus shows up, and he shows up there for good reason, and that is to change people's opinion. So the woman comes in. Reminds me of another story. There was a man by the name of Carl. Carl was, um, well, he's like some of us used to be. Uh, Carl, when he first came to, he slipped in the back door of a Pentecostal church, and he was there because an older woman invited him to come. So he slipped in the back door, 
and he decided to sit on the very back pew. He sat on the very back pew because he didn't feel like that he was dressed proper. He came in there, he had on a, he had on a, a, a muscle shirt, and it was kind of tattered and wrinkled and tore. He had on, uh, uh, what do they call it, cargo Bermudas, cargo shorts. He had a pair of run-over tennis shoes in. And, uh, and so he, he came in and sat down in the back. He had come from a different lifestyle. He'd come from a lifestyle of the street. He'd come from a lifestyle of dope. He'd come from a lifestyle of promiscuity. He used to buy dope. He used to sell dope. He even got sent away to jail because of his carryings on. And so he, he really just came to church because this sweet elderly lady just insisted that he come. What he didn't know was going to happen was this. When he sat down on the back pew next to the door in the back of the church, everybody that came to church that Sunday walked by him and saw him. And you know what they did? They did what every real Christian ought to do. Doesn't matter the status of a person's in life. They stopped, and when they stopped, they shook his hand. We're glad to see you. So proud that you're here. Want you to feel at home. Want you to have enjoy the service. And, and so anyway, the service came and went. And coming and going, well, he got up and he went outside to his truck hurriedly. As he went outside to his truck hurriedly, he got in and sat down, and when he did, he looked up, and here come another older woman. This older woman that was coming out the door, she was having a tough time walking. And uh, uh, so it was obvious that she was aged and had a tough time. So she made her way out, and she kept waving, wait, wait, wait. And she came over to his truck, got a hold of the mirror on his truck, reached her hand in and said, listen, I didn't get to shake your hand this morning, but I, I made my way out here because I want to tell you how glad I am that you're in church. <laughs> well, <laughs> he was overwhelmed with that. In fact, he pulled out of the church parking lot and just went a few blocks, and when he did, he just had to pull in and sit down. And of his own testimony, he said, I sat there and wept like a baby because I knew me. And I kept thinking, if they knew me like I knew me, none of them would want anything to do with me. <laughs> well, he came back to church, and eventually in coming back to church several times, he was baptized. Somebody taught him a home Bible study. They prayed him through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So it was that all of this was in his life. The woman at Sychar must have felt a lot like Carl felt, even though not everybody knew the story. The wonderful thing about Jesus is this. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what you've done. I want you to hear me this morning. Jesus knows all about it. And Jesus knowing all about it, he puts out his arms and he says, what you have been doesn't matter. But what I can make out of you does matter. Where you were doesn't matter. But where I want to take you does matter. And that love of God has got to spill over into every Christian that's alive and under the sound of my voice right now. And that is if we're going to make a difference in this world, it's going to be up to you and me to make the difference. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. So here's this woman living with her sixth man, not married to him. But Jesus, with his great compassion, said, I got something to give you. And if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. What I want you to understand is that when you hear these things, Jesus talks to tell us this. Jesus, let, let's take a quick look at the book of John, the 13th chapter, and verses 13, 14, and 15. Just want you to see this real quick. How many of you believe Jesus was a master? All right, here it is. John 13, verses 13, 14, and 15. Verse 13, back up one. There you go. You call me Master and Lord, 
And you say, well, for so I am. And if you, then your master and Lord, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. Next verse. For I have given you an example that, as, that ye should do as I have done. And what I want you to do, I want you to understand something. Jesus Christ gave us a pattern of not lordship. You see, on the day that he commissioned his disciples in the upper room at the Last Supper, he didn't pass out scepters. He didn't pass out crowns. He passed out towels. The role of a servant to take care of one another. And with that role of a servant, the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. He says, be you followers of me, even as I also am followers of Christ. Here's another thing that I like in the scripture. It goes on to say this. See, Paul wrote in another place, Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. He writes, Be ye therefore followers of God, as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. The thing about it, if you want to please God, I want you to know something. In this world today, just like that Samaritan woman had a great thirst for things to change her life, I'm telling you there is no shortage of that hunger in our world today. It drives people to a lot of places to do a lot of things that they'd be ashamed to do. But I want you to hear me, ladies and gentlemen. The Lord Jesus Christ is doing all that he can to reach out to whosoever will to get them to come unto him. So it says this, John 7 Verses 37 and 38, that great and last day of the feast, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of water. This spake he of the Holy Ghost, which was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. There is something to be said about the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I want you to know something. John 6 and 35 said it well like this. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. I want to drive home to this, that we need to connect to people. And as we connect to people, we need to share with them the living water and the wonderful, refreshing touch of the Holy Ghost in their lives. Somebody said, but Brother Harper, what about their lifestyle they're coming from? All right, I want to tell you how this works. You love them, you care for them, you get them to the house of God, let God convict their hearts. Bring them to an altar for repentance. Everybody said, praise the Lord. Bring them to an altar of repentance. Let's get them baptized in Jesus' name. Let's see them filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. Now, let's take it a step farther. Once people are born again, they develop such a hunger for God that they also develop a tremendous respect for the Word of God. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost will lead and guide you into all truth. And that truth is found in the Word of God. People become tremendously curious of what I've got. They may not have been a Bible scholar coming to it. They may not have even studied a lot of Scripture to recognize the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But once they get it, they're so overwhelmed with this mystery of God that's now is bountifully poured out in them their life, that their hunger makes them want to search the Word of God. When they start searching the Word of God, they find in the pages of the Word of God a lifestyle. There are things that the Bible will teach you to do that if I preached them across the pulpit, you would be offended by it. But if you find it for yourself in the Bible, it grinds down inside of you and brings a transformation into your life. That's the reason these Bible studies that they're given to these folks that have come to God is so very, very, very important. Remember something, folks. My mother used to say this, and I, I'm gonna, I'm, right now I'm going to tell you a true story. It's a terrible story. I heard my wife whisper, oh God. It's a terrible story. It happened in the state of Mississippi. 
it happened in a rally where that a young evangelist had come in to preach. There was a woman that night that was very, very much of ill fame in the community. I'm telling you a true story. And uh, she'd been promiscuous. In fact, she wore the labor of a whore. And so some of the other preachers kind of goaded that young man, young preacher, said to him, said to him, see that back there? This is such and such and such. You're preaching tonight, get the job done. When he got up, it was amazing that he spent most of his sermon tearing that poor girl apart, condemning her, beating on her, criticizing, chastising her. After service, he went back to his motel. The woman followed him to the motel. Oh, she didn't do anything ill to him. But she went in and she took a note and she laid it on the counter to the guy that attended the hotel and said, when you check this man out in the morning, give him this note. And the note said this, Dear sir, yes, I have been a prostitute. Yes, I have been a drug pusher and a drug user. Yes, I've had several marriages and several divorce. Yes, I have several illegitimate children. All of that is true. The world that I live in doesn't love me. They all criticize me. The world that I'm around is always abusive to me. I met a lady from your church and she told me with tears in her eyes and tears in my eyes. This is all in the note. She said with tears in her eyes and tears in my eyes. She told me that if I'd come to this church, that this church would love me regardless what it was. But tonight, when you spoke, you made it very clear. Not only does the world not love me, that the people of this church don't love me. She said, so I have decided that since nobody loves me, I'm going to end my life. And that night, she went out to the river and she jumped off a bridge. She committed suicide. I'm telling you that story for this reason. You saints of God and preachers in pulpits, you very, very mindful of what you preach across a pulpit. Weigh, weigh your words twice before you say them. Because when people come through those doors, this is just like a hospital. They sanitize that emergency room. They clean that emergency room. They try to keep it spick and span. But when somebody comes in from an accident that's tore all to pieces, maybe their sides are gushed out. Maybe bowels are coming out. It might be blood and disease and infection. But when they come through those doors, there's not a staff nurse works there and says, oh no, we're not letting anything that looks like that come in here. Let me tell you something. When they break those doors, they are a patient of Jesus Christ. And this is a hospital for souls. Oh yes. Doesn't matter where you come from. Brother Tim, you want to say something? Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Let me tell you the rest of Sister McGrady's story. The one that went out to the truck stood there and told the boy how glad she was there. You see, the rest of Sister McGrady's story is this, and she never forgot it. She had been a prostitute. Sister McGrady had been a drug user. And she knew all about what that side of life was like. And so she knew it didn't matter what Carl looked like. Oh, it didn't matter how that he was dressed. Because she remembered her first trip to a Pentecostal church. 
to thank God instead of some blistering person in a platform tearing her apart. There was some sweet women in that church that gathered around her and a life that was wasted and ruined all of a sudden is put back together by the grace of God, the love of God, the blood of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Ghost, the demonstration of His Spirit and falling in love with the Word of God. Oh, hallelujah. So, Apostolic Life Cathedral and I'm going to preach about this tonight. We have a purpose. Our purpose is to give hope to the hopeless, life to the lifeless, give comfort to the hurting, bring healing to the sick, bring peace to the mind that's troubled. We have a purpose, Apostolic Life Cathedral, and don't you ever forget it. And ladies and gentlemen, don't be afraid to invite anybody and everybody to the house of God. I don't care what their background is. I don't care what their persuasion is. I don't care what their lifestyle is. I want you to know something. When they walk through those doors back there, they are a patient of Jesus Christ. Why not bring it to the great physician? Why not bring them to the healer of all souls? Why not bring them to the Prince of Peace? The God of all grace and mercy. Praise God. Let us stand together. <laughs> Turn around and look at two or three people and ask them again, you ever make a bad decision? I got something to tell you. Aren't you glad this morning that you're standing in a house where whatever those decisions were, that they don't matter anymore because of the grace of God. And I invite you and each and every one of you to make your way to this altar of prayer. I invite you to come Oh, yes. Bring your families and friends to this altar. In Jesus' name. I don't want to be carnal at this moment, but I do need to remind you that when you leave service, go over and enjoy some of the spaghetti. It's going to help missionaries. You're going to eat somewhere today. But for you that are hungry for Jesus this morning, would you make your way? And let's come as a family. Let's come as a whole church. Let's come and gather around the front. That's it. Come on. Blood that my never, never out love. Oh, I love that. Sing it, sing it, sing it, sing it. I want to live the way He wants me to live. I want to give until there's just no more to give. Oh, I, I want to love, love to and help us pray while they say in the name of Jesus the way, way.
want to be. That's right. Sing the face of God for them. I want to be. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. There's just no more to give. I want to love. God, fill with the Holy Ghost. Help them understand the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. I could never. I could never. Be the life changer he needs to have, Lord. Hallelujah. 